Today, Dr. Clark is going to talk to us about the lenses, so this is the case how much curve you have that you don't want to talk about this subject in front of Dr. Grant Cherry. So, uh, good morning, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. All right. So I wanted to choose a topic um, for October, November, just um, something that would be uh, relevant uh, for um, the clinic, hospital, ICU, uh, kind of preemptively before um, uh, it happens, and it happens that the flu is kind of like that. Um, well, already starting. So, as you probably know, I have no disclosures. So the objectives today, we're going to discuss the transmission, the complications uh, of the influenza virus. We'll go into the epidemiology, both recent and um, past of influenza. Kind of the meat of it, we're going to be discussing the burden. That's what I really want to talk about of influenza globally and in the U.S. And then mention the vaccines, um, kind of, uh, and then what, what the recommendations are for this year. Um, there's many new vaccines available, some older, um, but really we, the big thing is that we want to improve uh, coverage and um, amongst all age groups. We'll discuss that. And if um, able to improve the vaccination of um, school-age children, then um, that can kind of control significant morbidity and mortality amongst all age groups. So starting off, uh, just some background. Here's uh, back in med school, here's our influenza virus. Um, it's segmented, means that it can recombine with itself or with others. Uh, such as something like the avian flu uh, can recombine with the human flu, and that's kind of what can cause pandemics. Uh, you have your hemagglutinin and uh, neuraminidase. Those are proteins that project out, and um, uh, they project out of the viral cell, and they're good immunogens. Um, when you make antibodies against these, then you're protected against the flu, and that's kind of what happens with the <laughs> seasonal or yearly flu vaccine. Um, so what happens is the hemagglutinin will um, attach to um, the uh, cell membrane, get absorbed, um, replicate inside, and then come out onto the outside of the cell membrane, and it's what the, uh, the neuraminidase is what cleaves the bond and to release the cells. Uh, things like um, oseltamivir, you know, Tamiflu stops the cleaving, so the virus stays attached to the host cell and eventually will die. Um, there's about 16 different hemagglutinins. Um, there's only three that have infected humans, uh, the H1, 2, and 3. There's others, um, um, but they are much less likely, um, and we'll go through those. Influenza types, as I stated before. Influenza A, this is what can cause ep epidemics and pandemics, uh, classified into subtypes. Um, and um, this is the what, type A is really what causes um, illness. Most of these viruses live in non-human uh, non-human species, um, H1, N1, and H3, N2 are the ones that what the vaccine has this year, or actually the last three years. Um, they also have some H5 and um, N1, H7, N2. Those have a much higher morbidity, but and have caused human disease, but they haven't shown to be um, spread amongst humans. So uh, those kind of aren't really as worried about. Um, you have influenza B, these can cause epidemics, classified into two distinct link, uh, lineages, the Yamagata and the Victoria lineages. Um, they are co-circulated worldwide, and especially in the U.S. since 2001. Um, and that is what our quadrivalent vaccination is against, both the Bs, Yamagata and Victoria. Um, type B usually only covers about 25% of the illness, and that burden usually comes along at the end of flu season, kind of towards March. So transmission, um, things like RSV really only have one with the um, large droplets. Um, so if you're kind of a little farther back, like three to five feet, then they don't really cause, you're kind of safe. With, um, um, with flu, it has two methods. Uh, they're different sized particles produced by coughing, sneezing, even breathing. Uh, the small ones, as you can see, can travel up to five feet. The large ones, you um, can, are a lot closer. Um, they have something where they measure with the flu, the, uh, the tissue culture infectious dose. Um, that's the amount needed to grow in the culture. Um, for those that are aerosol, you really, it's very minimal. You only need about three. 
and it'll um, to be causing disease. Something where it's more on contact, like if it's on a tissue on um, or uh, cloth, uh, you need anywhere you know upwards of about 500 to 1,000 um, uh, tissue culture infectious dose, uh, and that can kind of be if you touch your eye or your nose. Um, it stays alive on non-porous surfaces for about 24 hours, and then it'll stay alive for on tissue uh, and cloth and that kind of thing for about 12 hours. Um, it's unclear if that can kind of cause disease, though. So clinical features, um, it's a sudden onset of symptoms. Um, it can persist for up to seven, uh, seven to 10 days. Flu in children for under five years old is hard to distinguish from other URIs like RSV, metanumo, adenovirus, coronavirus. Um, the biggest thing to know is whether or not flu has entered the community yet. Um, it has an incubation period of about one to four days. Um, the infectious period of the wild type virus in adults, um, which is less communica communicable, uh, from about one day before through five days after the onset of symptoms, and children shed it for much higher and for a longer duration, uh, which is why we'll discuss later the importance of making sure that school-aged children are um, vaccinated against it. Clinical manifestations by group um, amongst the infants and children, adults as well. You'll see um, the cough is much more indicative later on. Um, you have fever. Um, the biggest thing um, for the younger infants is uh, GI symptoms. Um, you know, abdominal, um, it can somewhat, you know, uh, irritability, uh, perceived abdominal pain, diarrhea, vomiting, that kind of thing. Um, Complications in children, the most frequent upper and lower respiratory tract, sinusitis, bronchitis, bronchiolitis, pneumonia, croup, um, otitis media. Some of the more rare ones, but still do happen, are encephalopathy. Um, myositis, uh, this can kind of be if a kid is, um, you know, a healthy kid before walking, all of a sudden complains of some leg pain, uh, refuses to ambulate, maybe some tenderness. You want to think about maybe some myosite, uh, myositis. Um, that's mostly caused by influenza B. Uh, it can lead also to rhabdomyolysis, myocarditis, pericarditis, Rye syndrome, sepsis. Some of the um, exacerbations of some of the kids we have with underlying disease, such as cystic fibrosis, diabetes, asthma, and cardiovascular disease. One other thing that I mentioned here is also um, it's big with kids with neuro, uh, neurological disease. Sometimes with their respiratory um, function is a, is a lot less and they have trouble um, kind of expelling or um, remitting secretions. Uh, if they stay thick and that kind of thing, then they can, they're really, their uh, influenza infection can be a lot worse as well. <coughs> Some of the epidemiology, we're gonna go through kind of what happened. This is last year's chart. This is influenza positive reports uh, by the WHO um, from last year's um, flu. You can see for the most part, um, sorry, right here, um, in, you know, around the end of November, uh, early December, uh, you see this is when the big jump occurs. This has happened for the last, you know, this happens pretty much every year. Most of it at the beginning is, um, is the blue, which is A, uh, last year, H3N2. Um, this is also A, but subtyping not performed. Um, the black is influenza B. So as you can see, it's, it's onset or um, problems usually occur later, March a into April and even May. Um, the last year's was moderately severe with an overall um, high levels of outpatient illness, um, influenza associated hospitalization, pediatric deaths. Um, the um, when um, H3N2 does predominate, it usually is a more um, higher rates of uh, hospitalization and deaths. Um, it tends to be magnified like last year um, when the circulating strains don't match um, the vaccine strains. So um, as you can see last year, and we'll compare it to years before later about um, why last year's was so severe. This is just this year. This, was, this is as of week uh, 44, which I guess would be um, middle of October. So um, as you can see, similar to what we had been, um, the red is A, um, as well as the orange and the, green, uh, the yellow, that's all A. The green right here is, um, is B and it's very low right now, as expected. Um, this will kind of all jump as you get into um, December, uh, January, February, and then B will rise later on over here. 
Um, you have um, two different um, um, graphs. One, one of this is the NCHS, uh, the, mortality, the mor mortality surveillance system, um, and this one is the 122 city. Um, they're different in the way that they calculate. One is a week at a time, one is two weeks at a time, but um, comparing both of them, they're pretty much similar. Um, so this one right here, it, go, it starts in 2011, 12, 13, 14, 15, and like we had, we had been saying, the biggest peaks above the epidemic threshold come at the beginning of the year. This is January of every year. This is where we are today. We're still well below the epidemic threshold. Um, we're only at about 6% on this one, and um, just same kind of thing, about 5.8 or so on this one. Um, the um, last year's, 2014, was uh, moderately severe with overall high levels of outpatient illness, influenza associated hospitalization, and pediatric deaths. 81% um, of the H3N2 were, uh, were drift strains. Um, this, uh, because of a substantial number of deaths that occurred in 2003 and 2004, um, they started to measure the amount of influenza associated pediatric deaths. Um, I think um, that year they had about 153 deaths. Um, and if you look over the past four years, this, this year, so far none, 147, 111, 171 deaths. That's about an average of about 140. Um, but in 2003, 2004, they had about 153. Um, with 60, 70, 60 to 70% of the kids who did die from flu um, did not have any type of comorbid condition. They were um, what is described by the ACIP as healthy kids. Um, and that has pretty much stayed the same throughout the years from, from that time, the last 10, 11 years. Also, uh, one thing that also had stayed the same is the kids that do um, die from the flu or flu-related illness is 90% um, of them are unvaccinated. So that has occurred too. So um, you know, um, making sure the kids are vaccinated is the biggest thing that we have to work on. Um, Another thing for last year, um, and they do this for every year, is uh, by region, by the um, Health and Human Services. Um, if you look at the 2.5, the dark blue, that's our region right here. This is per million population, 2.5 uh, influenza-associated pediatric deaths. So let's talk more about the, um, the burden of disease, of uh, what, what flu can do globally, and what also they can do um, in the U.S. So, in terms of global estimates, um, about five to 20% of the infection of the world's population is, is infected every flu season. If you think about it, I mean, um, flu season is four to five months. And if you can have something that's contagious and infects 20 up to 20% of the world's population in that short amount of time, it shows up what kind of burden it can do. Um, about a billion cases each year, three to five million cases of severe illness, which would mean hospitalization. Uh, 300 to 500,000 deaths worldwide. Um, in children under five years old, you get upwards of 90 million new cases, 20 million with uh, acute uh, lower respiratory illnesses, a million of those being severe, and overall it can be anywhere between 30,000 and upwards of 100,000 deaths. The annual impact of seasonal influenza in the U.S. Um, still quite a burden. This is based on 2003 information. Um, you have about um, 610,000 life years lost, um, 3.1 million hospital days, uh, 31.4 million outpatient visits, with annual costs uh, to medical care um, about 10.4 billion, with um, lost earnings of 16.3 billion and a total <laughs> economic burden of 87.1 billion dollars. So as you can see, this is, um, if not just on the, the patients themselves, but on the economy, what kind of burden that influenza has um, each year. This is kind of a graph stating stay the same thing. Um, if you can see the, just kind of the tip of the iceberg right here, just including deaths and hospitalizations, it is you know, there. There's uh, you know, 50,000 deaths um, total and hospitalizations more than 200,000. But underneath, you'll see there's still 25 million physician visits, um, 50 to 60 million infections and illnesses, and upwards of 10 or plus billion dollars uh, the direct and indirect medical costs. Um, this is a chart um, that explains kind of, um, um, it was a community-based study about three major cities, um, Nashville, 
uh, Rochester, and I forgot the other one, but they, um, this is in confirmed influenza disease. So this is when the doctor is divided into ICU, hospitalized, and outpatient visits. So when, um, you know, out of what was 17% were tested that had flu. Um, so what that kind of means is that they had about 80% that had flu that were never tested. So, um, and about two thirds in the hospitalized patients and almost, you know, over 50% um, in ICU patients. So although hospital rates, they are important, um, the average annual rates of outpatient visits is upwards about 100 times um, as high for children um, below the age of five. Um, so although the rationale for enhanced vaccination against influenza has been primarily on hospital rates, um, reducing the number of outpatient visits um, attributed to prevention of influenza would, I think, in fact, um, decrease the costs or the burden uh, even more so than hospitalized. Um, this is um, rates of outpatient visits, uh, especially this one right here, um, panel A. This is by age. I don't know how well you can see it, but this is below six months, six to 12 months, one to three, three to five, and then uh, five to 15 years old. So the biggest rates of kids um, going to the outpatient visits are below 12 months old. Um, and um, this is also outpatient visits. This is where we are right now. This is us this year. But um, in terms of uh, the blue, this is last year. We have, in terms of when it is flu season, starting um, in the middle of December, we have huge amounts of outpatient visits for an influenza-like like illness. Um, this is similar to the same kind of thing. This is with hospitalizations, though. Um, so the rate of hospitalization is at the highest of kids that are less than six months. So the problem with the kids that are less than six months is that they cannot be um, targeted with the current vaccines that we have. Uh, we start them after six months. So the way that we can protect these kids is still making sure that all household contacts are vaccinated, um, still making sure that anyone who wants to be pregnant or who anyone is pregnant um, gets vaccinated, and that will lead to a lot more protection on these kids right here below the age of six months. They cannot be vaccinated themselves. Um, this was a study done in the 80s where they, they figured that children um, are frequently cited as the major vector uh, for transmission of influenza virus amongst families, households, schools. Um, and so um, they, they have a higher infection rates. Children have higher infection rates, prolonged shedding. Um, and with the large amounts of infectious virus, they come into contact a lot closer with other classmates, other children. So if you look, this was done um, for early um, in the season, peak, and late. And the purple and gold right here, uh, this is age five to nine, and this is age 10 to 19. So these school age kids early on in each season have the highest rate of influenza positive infections. As you go down later and later, the ones that, that grow are the kids that are less than five, the adults, middle-aged, and the elderly. So they were, um, this kind of just goes into line with the fact that um, if you can target these school-aged children early on, that it might delay or even decrease the amount of infection uh, or disease, excuse me, um, in the older adults, kind of protecting everybody. Um, and so this was a study done in Washington um, where they also experienced high rates of influenza infection, febrile illness, school absenteeism. And um, during the influenza outbreak, um, you had for every 100 students, you had 63 days missed of school. Um, you also had an increased work of, of increase of work absenteeism because the parents had to stay home and take care of these kids. Where for every um, um, where you had 20 of these, where that would be about one day of work for every three days of um, of school missed by these kids. Um, so economically, I mean parents aren't at work, kids aren't at school, then um, it's quite a burden. And we'll talk about the vaccine. So um, in terms of estimated vaccine preventable disease and deaths, influenza is by far the highest. 
So this is the amount of deaths in, uh, in the 90s um, for influenza in the United States. And it's vaccine preventable. It's by far the highest in terms of cases and deaths. So imagine just what, you know, having them making sure that they're vaccinated, how many lives and how many severe illnesses that could have saved. Back to this slide about um, the last four years, um, as we stated before, with these pediatric deaths, 60 to 70% of these um, kids were um, healthy before, no other comorbid conditions, um, and they weren't uh, at risk for any other type of medical conditions. 90% of them were unvaccinated, um, and last year's vaccine was only um, about 13% effective against the H3N2 chain, uh, strain um, and uh, leading to about 147 um, reported deaths. Um, these reported deaths, um, they think probably um, actually are about four times higher each year from the kids. Uh, this is just reported kids, you know, this is whenever this is uh, actually documented influenza virus, um, but they think that it could be upwards of, um, of 500 or so, 600, 800, um, that actually died from the flu that just, they, they weren't tested for it. So in the United States, um, we have a universal influenza immunization uh, recommendation for children, was made in about 2008 and expanded to all kids six months or older in 2010. Um, it has the potential to substantially reduce overall morbidity and mortality, um, but um, to achieve an impact, you need to have all these kids vaccinated. So um, one strategy is a school-based vaccination program, um, and then we'll talk about that in the next slide, but um, to complement not just protecting these kids, but also protecting um, adults and, every, and uh, elsewhere. So this was a study done in Japan where they had a avian flu in 1957, the H2N2, that took about 8,000 lives. On this line right here, the one that's uh, dotted is um, all causes of death. The one in the blue is, is um, pneumonia and influenza. So it kind of follows the line, and as you can see, probably every year around the time of the peak flu season, it spikes. This one happened to be a bigger spike right here uh, because of the avian flu. They claimed about 8,000 lives. Uh, it may not seem like a lot. I mean, Japan has a lot less population, but um, compared to what we have in America, compared to what we have in terms of how many older uh, citizens we have now, um, it would be a lot worse than that now, here, if that happened in America. But what they did was, in 1962, they um, started a program to vaccinate school children. And as you can see, the blue line, which is the pneumonia and influenza, the rates dropped dramatically amongst all ages. Um, they, in 1977, they made it mandatory, where influenza vaccine becomes mandatory. Um, that's you know, nearly 30, 35 years before we did, and it stayed down. The bad thing is that they didn't have these results until, as you can see, this came out in 2001, um, that, you know, science was kind of moving slow, but um, it worked. And in 1987, they wanted to see the results. They didn't have the results. But what they did was they allowed for parents to refuse vaccination, kind of a problem that we have here. And in 1994, it was discontinued. And as you can see, this line is going straight up again. So the CDC recommendations for vaccinations. Um, vaccination remains the best available preventive measure against influenza. Everyone gets it above the age of six months. Um, if you're considering or enduring pregnancy, I chose that word very carefully, <laughs> then uh, postpartum or breastfeeding, then make sure that vaccinated as well. Um, any underlying illness, um, healthcare workers, household contacts of those below five and above the age of 50 or with high risk uh, conditions and um, residents and staff of chronic uh, facilities. So um, um, influenza is effective in reducing the risk of these outpatient medical visits um, by the circulating influenza viruses um, by approximately either a half to three quarters in most people. Um, so this is this year's algorithm um, for, um, for the flu vaccine. Um, 
we have both the trivalent and quadrivalent vaccines are available this year. Um, neither one is preferred over the other. But um, both formulations contain an H1N1, um, an H3N2, um, different from the one that was last year. Even though it still is H3N2, it's different than the one it was last year. Um, as well as um, the quadrivalent having both Bs and the trivalent just having the Yamagata li uh, lineage. Um, and um, so if, as you can see, if the child received more than, so if a child received less than two uh, flu vaccines, if they're the, between the ages of two to eight, um, then they get two doses this year, four weeks apart, like always. If they received um, two or more flu vaccines at all, ever, um, then um, they only need just the one. No, even no, no boosters needed, even if they've had one each year for the first two years of life. <coughs> This is a list, it's not all of them, but this is a list of some of the, um, the flu vaccines. Um, um, you know, some of the contraindications, severe allergic reaction to any vaccine component. Um, if you have, uh, including the egg protein, um, concomitant use of aspirin, we'll go through that, aspirin containing medications in children and adolescents. Um, they also recommend that the, um, that the live attenuated vaccine, um, the flu mist, uh, not be used in pregnant women, immunosuppressed patients, patients with egg allergy, um, um, children aged two to four years who've had asthma and who've had, had a breathing treatment um, or have had a wheezing episode in the last, it's 12 months. So, um, and uh, for whom patients report that, um, um, or they, or maybe not seen a doctor, but if mom reports they had a wheezing episode, then you hold off on that. Um, you also don't want to give the live attenuated vaccine for people who've had any antiviral um, medications in the last 48 hours. Um, persons who care for severely immunosuppressed should not get it, or if they're taking care of that person, then they need to wait seven days before they go back and see that person. Um, some of the precautions uh, are moderate to severe acute illness with or without fever. If you have a history of Guillain-Barre, it's more of a precaution. I think they had a... Um, a flu vaccine in the 70s that might have had an increase in um, Guillain-Barre uh, like symptoms or, or diagnosis. Um, but they've, they've, since that time, they haven't showed any kind of um, indication or any type of um, correlation, excuse me, about um, kid, people who were vaccinated with the live vaccine um, and who had Guillain-Barre. But it still is a precaution just because of what happened, um, you know, 35, you know, for almost 40 years ago. So um, some of these ones, just going to, you know, we talked about the flu mist, but the Flusovax is a cold adapted vaccine. It has a master strain adapted to maximum growth at 25 um, degrees centigrade with minimal growth at 37 degrees. So um, it's good if, uh, because it's a master strain, they don't use eggs because um, this type of vaccine would be good if, um, if there was a pandemic, let's say later on in the season let's say now or let's say sometime in October, um, they need uh, that you wouldn't have, you wouldn't need as much time because I think you need hundreds of thousands of eggs um, to, um, to get the other vaccines, which you wouldn't have time for. Plus, if it's something like an avian flu, then you're killing all the chickens and birds and anything like that that would produce the eggs. Uh, so um, you, can use, um, you can use this one. Also, since there's no eggs, you can give it to someone with an egg allergy. Um, but uh, what it does is um, it, it's combined gene segments desired of the um, hemagglutinin and neuraminidase. But um, so it's, if it's, um, it, you know, it, your temperature in your nose is about 32 degrees, which uh, it will have, you might cause some rhinorrhea, not enough to cause infection. Once it gets down into your lungs, where the temperature is a lot higher, like 37 degrees, it won't cause an infection. You'll still get protection of it. Your body still sees it and makes antibodies to it, but you won't get an infection. The flu mist, uh, like we were saying this year, is uh, quadrivalent against the H3N2, H1N1, and the two B, stra uh, B strains, approved for people between the ages of two to 49. After the age of 49, it just hasn't been studied yet, and below the age of two, 
um, excuse me, then they felt that there was a um, slight increase um, or they were prone to wheezing. So they don't recommend it below the age of two. Uh, possibly more uh, in effective than the um, um, inactivated uh, influenza vaccine. Minimum uh, side effects. One of the contraindications is the asthma, I'm sorry, aspirin therapy. Um, because of the Rye syndrome. We don't have that in the United States. It still is present in the world, but um, you know, with aspirin, and then they also found that um, influenza and maybe even chicken pox can also trigger. So they just say, if you're on aspirin, don't get it. Um, pregnancy, of course, two to four year old asthmatics and uh, with, um, without a, with a wheezing episode in the last 12 months and severe um, immunosuppression and um, uh, caretakers. Some of the updates um, for 2015 and 2016, um, flu vaccines they found out kind of offer about six months of protection, which is perfect, because that's about how long the flu um, season is. Research study included more than 1,700 Americans of all ages, follow patients from 2011 to 2014, and who had received, um, and those who received the vaccine had um, six months. So if you're vaccinated in September, then you're protected all the way through March. Um, also, this year is going to be um, probably a better match than last year with only 13% being effective. Um, and then also um, kind of reading ab about some newer developments as well. They might be closer to developing a longer lasting flu vaccine. Um, they have this kind of stem region um, that may be present on all hemagglutinins, um, which helps connect the virus to the cell. and um, it will, if it's present on all, then what it may do is, um, since that, the, the hemagglutin varies every year, if that part stays the same, um, then um, if it doesn't vary every year, then your vaccines, you can kind of space those out. They may last for more than a year. The vaccine may last for upwards of um, two, three, five years, something like that, with still an antibody response. So some kind of take home points in summary. Um, influenza is a major uh, respiratory pathogen, kills anywhere between 3,000 and 5,000 yearly. Um, every year an influenza epidemic strikes the United States affecting upwards of 20% of the population, which is huge. Um, preschoolers and school aged children are the age groups most likely to be infected. And if, um, if those kids are vaccinated, then what you can do is probably protect um, even the um, adult population. Um, influenza causes more hospitalizations and deaths in children and adults than any other vaccine preventable disease in the United States. And um, the ones that do cause the deaths, as we discussed, were um, kids who were healthy and kids who were not vaccinated. Um, they're safe, offer a good level of protection. Um, the universal vac uh, influenza vaccine has the potential to substantially reduce morbidity across all age groups, um, healthcare costs as well and improving influenza vaccine coverage in children can reduce influenza illness in family members, um, those susceptible household contacts, um, anything concept uh, kind of like a herd protection. So that's all I have. Open up for questions. All right, good job. Good job. Dr. Koo? Um, do we have any data on a proportion of pregnant women or immediate peripartum period? What proportion of women are adequately protected or uh, have the vaccine? And this related question, obviously, if mum, for whatever reason, never had it, what's the mechanism why the baby can't get vaccinated if the baby is less than six months of age? Well, the second part of that question, kind of what we have for like the other vaccines, it's usually for kids that, you know, we start a series at two, four, and six months of these other vaccines, uh, just because um, the kind of the protein or the antibody don't really hold on. Um, and I think that's kind of the reason why we don't really have it below the age of six months. Yeah, the, the other reason was that the, the original influenza vaccines uh, caused a lot of fever and, and systemic reactions in very young children. So six months was kind of the, the time period where the vaccine was much better tolerated. So um, 
um, that became sort of the standard to give it at six months of age and older. And in regards to the pregnancy, um, at least here I've seen, I think our is pretty good. I don't know how it is across the nation. I'm, I'm assuming it's probably not as good as what it can be, but um, especially since a lot of these children, most of the hospitalizations, as we saw, were still below the age of six months. So I don't know how protected they are. I don't know if that's based on the amount of uh, immunization the mom got while she was pregnant, or um, if that's the household contacts around them that weren't vaccinated as well. So on a, on a good year, so in a healthy, otherwise healthy individual, flu vaccine is about 70% protective. That, the effectiveness is about 70%. And then that varies because if you, in older adults whose immune system is somewhat compromised or individuals who have compromised immune systems because of chronic disease, the effectiveness is less. And then, of course, when you don't have a good match, as Bo said, then, then the effectiveness even gets lower. And this year it was awful against H3N2 this past year because of the antigenic drift that occurred. So, uh, but in, in a good year, you get 70% 70, 70 effectiveness. And at our center, the, the proportion of pregnant women who get vaccinated, you know, who deliver here is above 90%. They do quite a good job in the OB clinic. Um, it's more sporadic out in the community delivered, you know, community uh, treated pregnancies because the OB guys are just not really good at being vaccinators. Um, and we know that for Tdap as well as flu out in the community. So, Mo, I think uh, to protect babies under six months, obviously, number one is to, be, is to uh, immunize their mothers when they're pregnant. Any other recommendations? Protect Siblings? Kids under six months. Siblings. Siblings. Yeah. Okay. Parents, making sure everyone is. Okay. Make sure everybody in the family everyone. is immunized. And so that, be, that should be one thing we should be doing when we discharge babies from the nursery, is making sure that parents know that uh, their babies are at significant increased risk during flu season and that they should all have had their influenza vaccines. I've seen your baby in a bubble today, here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's hard to do that. Okay. So, I'll give one uh, shameless plug for research. Um, we do have an open, approved clinical trial now for um, pediatric patients. Two through 18 years of age with uncomplicated flu, either inpatient or outpatient. Um, that is a head to head comparison of a single dose of intravenous paramivir, a one time dose, uh, compared to a standard treatment with also tamivir or tamiflu, a five day oral course. And um, so we will very shortly be coming around to clinics and looking and publicizing that trial availability for those. Uh, families that participate in the study, uh, they will want to know what it costs them. It doesn't cost them anything, but their reimbursement for participating in the trial is above $500. And so it's, um, it, it uh, at least will cover the inconvenience of, of the study. How do you do that? Um, is there a reason that there is no preference over a quadrivalent versus a trivalent flu vaccine? Uh, I mean, I, you go ahead. I, mean, I was going to say it would be. It would be. I thought it would be where they would. Um, they have. You know, um, I would say quadrivalent is is preferred because what they have in terms of the B versus Yamagata versus um, uh, the Victoria, they're only about fifty percent right every year, and so um, they have an idea of what the yearly. Uh, the yearly one will be, but they've been wrong most times, so that's why, um, or at least half the time. So like it's quadrivalent. Quadrivalent. Yeah. yeah, so that's true, and so I think you can offer your patients better protection if you give quadrivalent vaccine because of the inability to predict which of those two uh, clades are going to be circulating. The reason it's not officially a preferred vaccine is that it's only been out for a couple of years now. And we really don't have enough data to look at the relative efficacy of one versus the other effectiveness. Um, so um, being conservative in the sense that um, we don't have that data. And then the second thing is that the manufacturers have not all been able to gear up to, to give it. We don't want to say you need the quadrivalent vaccine and then not have it. And then the trivalent vaccines waiting there, which will give you 
protection against virtually all the strains except the, the missing B, and then not be vaccinated. So that's the other thing that the recommendation is. If you, whatever vaccine you have, you give, you don't wait for the other one to come in. You, you give what you have so that you can make sure you protect most people. For the case of uh, school-based vaccination programs, another thing we've been trying to get off the ground. Uh, this year we had uh, approval from Caddo and Bossier school districts both to do mass vaccination against flu in the schools. However, availability of uh, flu mists has been an issue and, um, and also a couple of the um, private insurance companies have elected not to sign on for school-based vaccination. So that's really uh, unfortunate because School-based vaccination is by far and away the most efficient way to get mass, you know, flu vaccine coverage. Um, but another year goes by with no school-based flu vaccination report. Yeah, and as Bo said, I think if you, with the data he showed very clearly indicate that if you immunize school-age children, you can prevent a significant amount of disease in the preschoolers, as well as parents and grandparents, who may have increased risk for morbidity and mortality. So. What about daycare? Has anybody studied daycare, especially with it's it's Because that is the major source of, <laughs> of, <laughs> the major source of your grass there. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, daycares, are not, daycares are not allowed to go to um, hog farms and chicken farms during the winter time <laughs> just to make sure there's no crossover and <laughs> create new strains. But yeah, it's clear. I mean, daycares are a cesspool of viral diseases, and um, especially in the winter time, it, it's sort of uh, anticlimactic. There's not a whole lot to study uh, except vaccinate, vaccinate, vaccinate. You know? And it's and so we know what happens. It's a matter of making sure the kids get vaccinated and good precautions to take care. And some states now have a requirement to go to daycare that your child has had influenza vaccine. Isn't it not this one? Not this <laughs> Isn't it a regulation with farmers they can't have the chickens in the in the same area as the pigs? I think that's just that they keep kosher. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Probably they couldn't even be around each other. Yeah. But that is that important. Sense. I mean the influenza viruses that circulate can infect pigs, humans, <coughs> and birds. And so uh, crossing over from one species to the next is what often results, as both said, in a, in a new strain of influenza and that can potentially cause a pandemic. Yes. Right. And actually we, there was a swine flu variant that about two three years ago, two years ago that uh, if you went to a state fair, um, you ended up having a high risk of developing that infection. Luckily that virus was not able to transmit effectively from person to person and the cases died out. But that's exactly what happened. Okay, so everybody's gotten their flu vaccine for the year. Anybody who hasn't needs to go to employee health immediately um, and get that done. Uh, not only protect yourself, but protect your patients, and that's part of your job. Okay, Bo, thank you. That was great. Thank you.